Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pihu, Nimisha. Good morning, Anita. Good morning, Prem. Good morning. Let everyone just join. Wait for a minute. Okay. Come on, like this session, share it. Good morning, Swati. <clears throat> Correct, so we are into our sixth lecture. Okay. Let everyone join. Hello, Raj. Good morning, Muni. Okay, so in this lecture, we are talking about the further things that are left in C. elegant. Good morning, Prachi. So we are going to talk about the cleavage process. Good morning. Good morning, all. I hope everyone is doing really well. Yes. Good morning, Sachin. Okay. So a brief overview, some informations. Okay. Whoever wants to buy this book, okay, Chandrama, right? The PYQ's book, you have 23 years PYQ's with explanation you will get in this book, okay? It's currently the best seller and 60,000 copies have been sold. And, you know, you can get this in Amazon and Flipkart. So, you can go and buy this. You have 40% discount in this book and you are getting at the sale price of 900 okay again there is the crash course for csir that is going on okay it has started from okay it has started from 6th of november then there are recorded courses okay recorded courses at 30 percent off you can use this promo code Okay, Anita. Thank you. Right. You can also share it with your friends that, you know, whoever wants to practice questions because practicing the question is very important. Right. You keep on revising or you keep on reading newer, newer stuffs, but you forget what you have done or you don't know how that question was solved, how that numerical was, you know, basically numerical based question. So, PYQs are very important and you are getting that with explanation as well. Correct. And till this June. So, this you have 23 years of papers are available. Okay. Live courses has started from 27th of November for 2024. Correct. So you can join whoever wants to take this session. And also there are test series. So tests are very important. You have just your exam in 20 days. Correct. So you can get this test series with this coupon code. You will get the 30% off. Right. Shall we begin? Shall we begin? Yes, everyone, everyone is active and breathing. Correct. Good morning, good morning, good morning all. Okay, so till now what, so a little recap, let's do a little recap of what we did in the last lecture. PG, ke subject se kare zoology? That is upon you, right, Chandrama? Which subject do you want to do or what was your uh, subject in the bachelor's? That will decide, correct? I think if you have done uh, zoology in bachelor's, you cannot do botany in PG. I am not sure about that, but I think that is not the case. You have to have that major subject in bachelor as well. See, if you want to give net exam, there is no subject restriction per se. So, all subjects, botany, zoology, microbiology, biotechnology, okay, even uh, other, I think, bioinformatics, biochemistry who have their uh, major done in those subjects as well can give net exam. So, it's not about that. For net eligibility, any subject is... Uh, you know, you can give the exam. 
but I think if you want to do PhD, so that will you know, decide whether if you want to do in botany or zoology, you can do or you can take the PG uh, you know course accordingly. Anyways, so in re so we will see a recap of what we did in the last lecture. Okay, so we talked about the vulva development. Yes, so I hope everyone has seen the last lecture. Correct. There we said that how that how uh, initially the specification was happening. Correct. Specification of the eleven cells. Then so VPC from that we got the VPCs. Six VPCs. Then. We did the patterning that is we made primary, secondary and tertiary. Primary and secondary went on to make 22 adult vulva cell. Yes or no? Correct. The primary and secondary went on to make the adult cell and the tertiary made the hypodermis. That means it was making the skin cells. So hypodermis production or hypodermis, uh, you know, Formation of hypodermis is a default fate. So, if you do not give certain paracrine factor or the signaling is absent, you will see that there is skin formation instead of the vulva. Okay, in the six VPCs as well, when we saw that the other, uh, you know, rest of the cells were making the uh, skin cell, they were fusing into the epidermis and only the six VPCs were getting specified with WNT signaling. Correct. So, again, you can see here. So, here we have sperma theca which stores the sperm so we are talking about the hermaphrodite here right then <clears throat> there is this oviduct uterus is there this vulva region is there so you can see a small opening correct here also you have spermatheca for sperm storage yes so now fertilization has happened imagine so your oocytes were here sperms were here so somehow self fertilization happened in this region and you are getting what you are getting the embryos correct till now we have understood that yes fertilization is happening we are getting embryos now the embryos are going to undergo cleavages to make uh, you know ball of cells with having multiple cells and then it will make the you know another worm entirely so here if we zoom this region, so we are zooming this region, correct? Initially, we are starting with the zygote. We are starting with the zygote. And now we have to know the axis also, anterior, posterior axis. We will see that how that is getting decided. Then there is this formation of ABP that you see initially. So the first cleavage has made AB cell and P1 cell. So, stem cell and founder cell is what will come into the picture. Then ABA, ABP and EMS. Okay. Then P2. Then further you have lots of cleavages happening. Correct? So, that is what we are going to talk about in this lecture. That how this cleavage or how the interaction is deciding this cleavage to happen. And what all types of cells or uh, you know... Um, Suppose AB cell has to make what kind of cell? That is also we will see. So what type of cleavage is present in this nematode? That is our C. elegant rotational holoblastic type of cleavage. Okay. There are different types of cleavages. If you have done. Yes. Yes, Prachi. Right. So if you have done the development already, you know that there are different types of cleavage and question comes directly asking you that Suppose rotational holoblastic is present in which kind of uh, organism, correct? So, remember as we are doing C. elegans now, so remember it is rotational holoblastic, okay? It is present in nematodes and mammals, okay? It's present in nematodes and mammals and it is going to have a asymmetric kind of division. How the zygote is dividing? It is going to divide asymmetrically. Correct. Where else we saw the asymmetric type of division? Tell me. We also saw asymmetric type of division. Where we saw that? Which cell was doing it? Tell me, tell me, tell me. 
which cell was doing the asymmetric type of division. You will tell me, we will go ahead, okay. So, when zygote is dividing, we are getting two types of cell, right. We are getting founder cell, the first cleavage that we saw, we are making two cell, founder cell and stem cell. So, this is our two cell stage. Nobody has answered where we saw the asymmetric kind of division. So, the founder cell will go ahead to make the differentiated cell, right? All the differentiated cell, that means the cells of the worm body, correct? All the cells are going to made in the, by the founder cell. So, it will go ahead to make differentiated cell, whereas stem cell will be present, right? At the end, it is going to be present in the germ cell and it will keep on dividing more and maintaining its pool. Yes, Prachi, we saw it in vulva cell, oh, sorry, stem cell, very good, not in vulva cell. We are talking about asymmetric type of division, correct? In stem cell, right? So, this stem cell will again, so this was the first cleavage, this was the first cleavage. The stem cell will again divide into founder cell and stem cell. Because we know that stem cell has to maintain its own pool. It does the self-renewal. Yes, Prachi. Right? It does the self-renewal. So, Lord, there were the self-renewal that was happening. Okay? So, this stem cell again will go ahead to make one founder cell. One stem cell. Understanding? So, that is how the cleavage is happening, right? And the founder cells, what are the founder cells? What are the types of founder cells that we are going to see? What are their names? A, B, M, S, E, C and D. Okay. Yes, Anshu. Right? And stem cells will be from P1 to P4 lineages. Okay, P1, P2, P3 and P4 will be the stem cells and the founder cells will be A, B, M, S, E, C and D. Okay, so rotational type of, rotational holoblastic type of cleavage and asymmetric cleavage is what we are going to see. Correct? Now let's start with the cleavage process. So, one by one, you will understand that how the cleavage is happening. Everyone be with me, correct? So, this zygote first divides into a B cell that is our founder cell and it makes one stem cell that is P1, okay? Initially, first cleavage, this has happened. This P1 then again will divide, yes or no? It will divide into EMS and P2. Then this P2 will divide into C and P3. P3 will divide into D and finally P4. Yes, everyone. So, zygote is dividing initially into A, B and P1 first cleavage and the second cleavage happens. P1, the our stem cell will divide into EMS that is our founder cell and one P2. P2 again will divide into C, founder cell and one stem cell that is P3. Then it will again divide into T that is founder cell and P4. Okay. Now we have further cleavages. So this AB will make AB anterior. Okay. And AB posterior. What it will make? Everyone is sleeping. Yes. Everyone is sleeping. Please like the session, share it. There are very few people. Okay, please share it. It's an important, important topic. Correct? So, AB went on, has went on to go, uh, went on to make AB anterior and AB posterior. Very good, Prachi. So, this AB anterior again divides, okay, it again divides into AB anterior left, right? AB anterior 
right left and right in the anterior axis also we are making the left right cells ab posterior also will make the same ab posterior left and ab posterior right okay so ab anterior will divide into left and right ab posterior will divide into again left and right botany lover i am not exactly sure about the time okay check and let you know yes so ems again divides into ms and e okay ms and e c has okay till here is fine so our zygote initially has made these two cells and it kept on dividing now we will see that what kind of cell these are making so a b a anterior that is is going to make pharynx hypodermis and neuron okay p h n you will remember it as p h n so initially here i will write p h n a b a right also is making pharynx hypodermis and neurons okay p h n p h n then we are making hypodermis a b posterior a b posterior is making hypodermis and neurons thank you anita okay both a b anterior and posterior will make hypodermis neurons so what we have got we have got h n h n now m s m s is making m p g that is muscles pharynx and gonads okay m p g because why we are why i am writing like this because once you know the cleavage process that yes ab ms ecd ab in ab you have to make anterior posterior in anterior posterior you have to make left and right so if you have drawn this whole thing and if you remember the sequence if question asks you that whether uh, phn is made by the ab you can you will be able to answer it and believe me questions come like that okay so it's important for you to know that which type of cell has these uh, differentiated cells are you know the uh, these founder cells are making at the end okay e is making intestine okay we have intestine then c will make mhn that is muscle hypodermis and neurons right and d will finally go to make muscle and p4 will make germ line cells okay it will make germ cells that are z1 and z2 yes everyone you were with me the whole time yes or no so intestine after intestine we have mpg then we have muscle and finally we have germ line cell correct so how you will remember phn phn hn hn correct then mpg intestine mhn so mhn and mpg is sandwiched okay intestine is sandwiched between the mpg and mhn then muscle right intestine muscle like that it will come alternatively and finally germline cell yes memorized fitted in your head correct so initially you will you can write this cleavage process if you are not able to remember like that correct it, it will take just 30 seconds and you can remember this sequence it will directly come into your head okay so the total number of cells it is making thank you vishal the making is uh, i think yeah till here the whole ab is making 389 cells right uh, let me just 
okay so these four cells the aba left aba right abp left and right are making 389 cells the mpg is making around 80 cells okay in intestine you have 20 cells MHN that is your muscle hypodermis neurons and neurons also it is making two neurons only okay so in total it is going to be 47 cells in this muscle also you have 20 cells and the germ cells will be two cells correct two cells so initially we talked about that number of cell in somatic uh, the whole CL again right 959 somatic cells so likewise you can see here that how these cells are getting differentiated into these number of cells so this worm has only 949 cells okay it will only have of 20 muscle 20 intestine cells only 20 cells can you imagine just 20 cells in muscles only 20 for intestine okay only 20 cells so that is why you know C. elegans is a model organism and it becomes very easy to manipulate and you know do uh, scientific studies in this organism got it everyone everyone understood understood this cleavage process it is very important take few seconds to fit this in your head the, this whole picture should be crystal clear to you correct okay okay everyone now let's go to talk about the anterior posterior axis so what we said in the zygote in this zygote we said there is some anterior you know region there is this posterior region so when egg and sperm is going to come together yes we have the egg and what we are making we are making the zygote correct good morning anita we are making the zygote now we have to decide that what side is going to be the anterior posterior who will decide who is going to come and decide this that whether this is anterior or this is posterior this is anterior this is posterior which will be anterior posterior who is going to decide anyone knows anyone knows about this what decides the anterior posterior axis in c elegant in the zygote and uh, mind you that there will be different uh, you know for different organisms the anterior posterior decided by different uh, whether molecules or structures okay yes anita okay everyone tell me who is deciding this anterior posterior who knows this Come on. So, the side where the male pronucleus, the male pronucleus, okay, the side where the male pronucleus is going to reside becomes your posterior. Okay, we are not saying the entry site of the sperm. So, don't get confused if the question, you know, kind of tricks you and it can trick you that, okay, the sperm has entered at the, from this region and that entry point will become the posterior. No, the male pronucleus, sperm has entered, it has released its pronucleus. Okay, the pronucleus will be inside the egg, right, the oocyte and the pronucleus will reside in some position. It will take some position. That position position of the nucleus is what is going to decide your posteriority in the zygote correct and the opposite pole so this has happened posterior has been made now we know that yes the opposite pole will go ahead to make what opposite pole will make your anterior simple you have to remember just one that where the sperms or the male pronucleus is residing that will be our posterior the opposite will be the anterior everyone yes understood so oocyte oocyte per se has no polarity 
who said the egg is not having the polarity. So, the sperm pronucleus, the male pronucleus will decide the polarity. Okay. So, the anterior, posterior poles are decided by your male pronucleus position. I hope this is clear to everyone. Okay. The position of the male pronucleus is deciding the AP axis and oocyte do not uh, you know gives it will not give any polarity to the zygote and what we are seeing so before the division itself we haven't decide uh, we haven't divided the zygote yet the cleavage is cleavage is not happening till now so before the division itself we have decided that this will be anterior and this will be posterior right so before the division we know uh, with the position of the male pronucleus, okay, this is posterior, this is anterior. Now, there are also second AP, okay, second axis, second AP, uh, the anterior posterior asymmetry is seen shortly after the fertilization. The moment fertilization has happened, okay, so pronucleus has, uh, you know, entered and it has taken the position that becomes your first uh, kind of uh, anterior posterior that we are seeing. Second, we See the migration of pre p sorry p granules that also decide the axis okay so p granules and a ribonuclear protein which will specify germ cells so these p granules will finally go and reside in the p4 that is in the germ cells okay now let's talk more talk more about this p granules so, it is making your second AP axis. Second AP axis. Okay, what we are saying is, yes Prachi. So, what we are saying, this you understood that the male pronucleus is going to decide the posterior or the mainly the AP axis. It is going to decide that you have done the fertilization. Okay, sperm, the pronucleus has entered the oocyte. It has taken a position that is your posterior. So, before division, the cell, the zygote has not divided. The first cleavage hasn't happened. Before that only we know that yes, this is the posterior. This is the anterior pole. That is the first axis. Then this was happening with the male pronucleus. Then there is P granules. There is another, you know, factor that is P granules. The migration of the P granules also decide the anterior posterior axis. That will be seen after this first axis has been, this decision has been made. Now clear Prachi? Correct? We are going to talk about that. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> so this P granules, yes, thank you. So this P granules is going to move. We saw that there is this migration going on. So where it is going to get migrated? This P granules is moving toward the posterior end. P posterior. P posterior. So P granules will move to the posterior end and it will make the posterior axis and the opposite will be the anterior. So basically, suppose sperm entered, uh, pronucleus is residing here. This is your pronucleus. Okay. So initially we know that yes, this is going to be the posterior, this is going to be the anterior. Now there are these P granules, P granules, these P granules also migrate towards, so it knows no, that male pronucleus is sitting there, I have to run towards it, kind of it runs, runs, run towards the posterior and it will, you know, kind of make the second AP axis, second decision, okay, kind of that yes, this is posterior, we have confirmed this is going to be the posterior this is going to be the anterior. Okay. Clear? So, this P granules are moving toward the posterior end. Okay. Of the zygote. Yes. So, we have made the posterior axis. Now, the localization of this P granule. So, who is deciding that how the P granules are migrating? Okay. Can they just float away? It needs some uh, help, okay? It needs an aiding factor that is our cytoskeleton. 
who is going to come into the picture cytoskeleton cytoskeleton is going to localize these pea granules and it will kind of hold good morning biology point no problem so these uh, what i was saying the cytoskeleton will hold the pea granules in the posterior and it will localize it there okay it will localize it there and which cytoskeleton that to microfilament not microtubules anita here microfilament is responsible for localizing these pea granules in the posterior pole okay so how we came into know how we came to know that yes this is microfilament and not microtubule so we did an experiment okay we did an experiment where we used so the zygote was treated okay we treated the zygote with cytokalasin d please remember this name so we treated the zygote with cytokalasin d and when we did that we saw that there was no migration okay no migration of p granules towards the posterior end so somehow cytokalasin d is inhibiting this migration yes or no we treated the zygote with cytokalasin d and we saw that the migration is not happening the p granules are not migrating so that means cytokalasin d was inhibiting p granules migration yes good morning lovely so the cytokalasin d is inhibiting the p granules and what is the cytokalasin d it is a microfilament inhibitor who is this so cytokalasin d is actually a microfilament inhibitor no problem no problem yes so cytokalasin d is a microfilament inhibitor so we came into the conclusion that when we used cytokalasin d it is inhibiting the migration so somehow the migration uh, is done or the localization uh, you know is done by this microfilament okay microfilament is kind of helping this low in localization and in this migration correct and we did one more thing so we were not happy with this we wanted to confirm it more so we used colchicine we used colchicine so we used cytoclasin d as well as colchicine colchicine is what what kind of inhibitor colchicine is tell me colchicine what type of inhibitor it is going to inhibit which uh, our uh, cytoskeleton which cytoskeleton it is going to be microtubule inhibitor microtubule inhibitor yes so colchicine is inhibiting the microtubules so when we applied or when we treated the zygote with colchicine we saw that happily the p granules were migrating and getting localized in the posterior posterior pole of the zygote so we saw migration so from this experiment what you are going to conclude what is the end result that for p granules migration and localization we need microfilament and not microtubule so microtubule does not have any role to play in this microfilament has a important important role yes everyone got it everyone with me okay so that's how the p granules are playing an important role in deciding the posteriority yes biology point okay now there are so in p granules itself we have more these factors which decide the anterior posterior more factors are coming so this is partitioning the pars are the partitioning factors okay so in anterior pars we have par 6 so nothing to know in detail about this so the names are important so for anterior par we have par 6 and par 3 okay and for posterior par 
we have power 2, power 1 and power 2. Yes, everyone, these are partitioning factors that are there. Posterior, in posterior you have 1 and 2 and for anterior you have 6 and 3. Okay. So, the post, here let's write, so the anterior axis anterior axis is opposite, final conclusion is it is opposite to the male pronucleus. Pro and we see that par 6 and 3 are getting accumulated here. And for posterior axis, the conclusion is the place of the male pronucleus, okay, male pronucleus position. And we see that par. 1 and 2 are accumulating. Correct? Everyone with me so far? Yes, so that was about this power factor. So, you should know which power is accumulated, accumulating in which pull poles. Correct? Okay, now we are going to talk about the specification. Okay, specification so, zygote, we saw that it was dividing into the founder cell. Okay, it was dividing into the founder cell and stem cell. Yes or no? Initially, no one is replying, answering what happened. Went into sleep Saturday, early morning. Okay, is that so? So, founder cell. Now, the thing is going to come about the conditional autonomous specification. Okay, conditional autonomous specification. I think Prachi told me, who told me? Yes, conditional autonomous specification is going to come into the picture. So, in founder cell, what were the cells? First, let's write about that. We had A, B, right? We had M, S, E, C and D. These were our founder cell. Yes, stem cells were P1, P2, P3 and P4. Correct. So, the founder cells are autonomous or conditional? You will tell me. Founder cells are these are differentiated cells and stem cells are there which are obviously undifferentiated. Correct? So, who will be the conditional? Conditional meaning they want, uh, you know, they want the interaction, they get influenced with the environment, they interact with the cell and depending upon that, they change their cell fate. Autonomous was, it was Having all the information, it was kind of getting already specified. It just needed the, yes, right? It was autonomous, everything it was doing on its own, okay? It was specified. So, we saw that how the prospective fate and the prospective potency. So, prospective fate was equal to prospective potency in the autonomous and in conditional, the prospective uh, Potency was greater than prospective fate. Okay, it has lot, it had lots of potential. So the founder cell is definitely it is going to be conditional. Very good. Right? It is going to be conditional. It is going to uh, follow the conditional specification because it wants to interact, it, ha it had to interact with these stem cells. Okay. The first cleavage that is P1 and A B, we will see that how the interactions are happening and that is deciding the cell's fate. And stem cell is going to be the autonomous specification. Okay. So, initially we have this AB cell in the founder cell. So, if you keep this AB cell in isolation, you will tell me what will happen. If you keep this AB cell in isolation, that means you, you are not letting this AB cell to interact with the other cell. 
what will happen if AB cell is isolated? It is a founder cell. We are keeping it in isolation. First condition, tell me. If AB cell is kept in isolation, will you be able to make the differentiated cell or the, you know, further cleavage? Yes. So, if you keep it in isolation, it will not be able to make the, you know, entire process. It will not be make, will be able to make all the cell lineages. So, it will make only few cells. Okay. But, if you keep this P1, that is our autonomous specification that is following, if you keep the P1 cell without the AB, what will happen? It will go ahead to make all cells because it knows. So, the further cleavages, okay, P1 will divide into that. If you see this, yes, we saw that P1 is dividing into EMS. Yes, very good. So, P1 is dividing into EMS, then P2, then P2 will divide into C and P3, then D and P4, okay. So, this will be, a, it will be able to make. Yes, yeah, it will make all the cell lineages. Okay, if you have understood this, this was the main funda. Okay, so if you have understood this cleavage, let's go into the transcription factors which are important for this interaction. Okay, so the first transcription factor that is coming into the picture is SKN1. SKN1. So, this transcription factors are actually identifying the blastomere, okay, they are identifying the blastomere, the first one that we are going to talk about is SKN1. So, when EMS is dividing, okay, we have this EMS, the EMS cell, it is going to divide and make MS and E, right, E was making what, you will tell me, which type of cell, MS and E, what cells they were making. For this, you want this SKN transcription factor to be active for this division to happen. Everyone answer, MS was making what type of cell? It was making MPG, yes or no? It was making muscles, pharynx and gonads and E was making intestine. E say intestine. Okay, E say intestine. So, E is making intestine MPG from MS cells. Correct. So, this SKN1 protein, sorry, transcription factor is a kind of, it's a protein only, it's a maternal protein. Okay, it's a maternal protein and it is going to control what it does, it controls the EMS fate. So, SKN1 will decide because it is deciding or it is kind of helping in this cleavage to happen. So, SKN1 will have this control over the fate of the EMS. And the cells are going to generate posterior pharynx. Okay. The cells are going to make the posterior pharynx. Pharynx in the posterior pole because it is making the pharynx right muscle pharynx gonads so we will go ahead to make this pharynx so this skn this transcription factor is going to activate the genes which are responsible for the pharynx and intestine okay these are the major things that it has to make also gonads and muscles but other cell lineages were also making gonads, muscles and pharynx. So, they are, you know, simultaneously making them. SK1, SKN1 specially kind of helps in the activation of the proteins which was responsible for the making of pharynx and intestine. Right? So, if you do the mutation in SKN1, what will happen? If you do the mutation in SKN1, so you have mutated SKN1. 
definitely will you be able to make the pharynx or intestine no pharynx so we see that pharynx are not made when skn is mutated when skn is mutated we see that there is no pharynx and the default fate is run that is it will develop into hypodermal cells that is our skin cells everyone so if you are mutating yes if you are mutating yes prachi so if you are mutating the skn1 you are getting skin so skn1 for skin you can remember like mutation of skn1 you will get skin that means you are not getting pharynx so the ems so the ems kind of looks like c what c was making let's see what c was making it was making muscle hypodermis and neurons okay so here it is making the hypodermis correct so this ems kind of looks like the c type of founder cell okay yes so the ems kind of looks like the c type of founder cell okay so what we see that the ems is getting ems blastomer is getting respecified as your c okay it is getting respecified as c and the cells which were destined to form pharynx and intestine they will now become what they will be affected so we are not getting that so first transcription factor clear yes first transcription factor clear or no yes anita there will be effect in that intestine formation also but what we see is right this intestine is also getting affected but majorly we see that pharynx are not made right clear clear yes or no for sk1 skn1 transcription factor everyone tell me so sk1 skn1 is important for controlling the ems fate right it is going to make your posterior pharynx majorly if we see that pharynx is getting affected intestine will also get affected so skn1 mutation will lead to the respecification of the ems cell as c so it kind of looks like c because it is making the hypodermis fine now let's go into the pal1 okay everyone pal1 our second transcription factor pal1 so this is what this is going to decide the somatic descendants of p2 blastoma okay now the p2 cleavage from p2 we had the same what were getting what we were getting keep this image in your head yes from p2 we were making c and p3 so we are saying that pal1 is going to play a key role in this division in this cleavage pal1 will affect this if there is mutation in pal1 we will see that these things are getting affected yes okay so normal development of somatic cells somatic cells that is our c okay it is getting affected so if you mutate your pal1 we see that there is absence of muscles there is absence of muscle and we also see that the d fate is also getting affected no somatic cell from d is also happening that means our muscle we were forming muscle 
from D because this division is affected. So somehow we are seeing that the D fate is also affected. We are making muscle in both cases. Correct? So C and D fate is affected with the mutation in PAL1 transcription factor. Correct? So you have to remember the somatic descendants of C and D are affected with PAL1. Then third one, third category is MEX3. Yes, Sachin. Right? MEX3. So MEX3 is an RNA binding protein. Okay, it's RNA binding protein and MEX3 is going to inhibit PAL1. MEX3 hates PAL1. So whenever MEX3 sees PAL1, it's just going to shoot it. It's going to inhibit it. Okay, MEX3 is inhibiting PAL1. MEX3 hates PAL1. Okay, MEX3 got inhibited. So wherever MEX3 is present, PAL1 will be absent. Okay, wherever you see that MEX3 is there, PAL1 will not be there. It will be like, it will be like I don't want to see your face. Just, just go from here. Okay, so MEX3 deficient. Now you saw that yes, if MEX3 is present, PAL1 will not be there in the vicinity. You cannot see PAL1. So MEX3 deficient mutants, the mutants who are deficient in MEX3, what will happen? PAL1 will be happily there. Okay, there is no one to inhibit the PAL1. So what we see, we see the PAL1 there and we see that PAL1 is present in all blastomere. Okay, and if PAL1 is present in all blastomere, we are going to get what kind of fate? Muscle, right? We were making the C and D. PAL1 was responsible for the P2 uh, blastomere somatic cells development, correct? So if we are seeing PAL1 everywhere, kind of we will see muscle everywhere. Yes or no, which we do not want that. So MEX3 kind of properly inhibit the PAL1 where it is not required. So inhibition is also important, right? So if MEX3 is not there, PAL1 is everywhere. So that we do not want. There is one more inhibition that is going on. So SKN1 that we saw initially inhibits PAL1. SKN1 also inhibits PAL1. So no one likes PAL1. Everyone is inhibiting PAL1, right? So if skin, the SKN1 is also inhibiting PAL1, we see that the PAL1 is prevented to getting formed in EMS. We do not want PAL1 in EMS. PAL1 is only for C and D. Remember, PAL1 is only for C and D. So SKN1 was responsible for the EMS cleavage. So SKN1 will make sure that PAL1 is not there in my place. Okay, in my area, PAL1 should not be there. I will inhibit the PAL1 and I will prevent the formation of the C and D fate in EMS because PAL1 kinds of make the somatic descendants of C and D. Got it? Got this funda, this logic? Everyone, it is important. Tell me. Understood? Yes or no? Come on. Yes or no? Waiting for you. See, in for MEX3, let's see. MEX3 will inhibit PAL1. MEX3 do not want the descendants of PAL1, what, what PAL1 was doing, it was making the C and D somatic cell descendants. So MEX3 kind of is inhibiting the PAL1's presence there because it does not want in that particular place. Yes, surely we'll do the summary, okay, at last. Yes. So MEX3 is inhibiting PAL1, fine, clear. Now SKN1 also is there which inhibits PAL1. SKN1 was making the or deciding the EMS cell fate. It was helping in that cleavage. So in EMS, what we will make? For EMS, we are making the MPG, muscle pharynx, gonads and intestine. Correct? So in 
EMS in that place, in that cell, we do not want the PAL1s present or the somatic cell of CD fit. Okay. Good morning, Shivani. So, we do not want the CD fit because at every founder cell, we want only those cell to get divided. That is the basic idea. We do not want other cell fate to be present in other founder cell. Okay. C and D should make C and D cell fate. So, who is deciding that these transcription factors? So, SKN1 will inhibit PAL1 in its place, that is EMS. So, PAL1 will not be present in EMS and we are going to get MPG and intestine happily there. And if MEX3 is not there, we see that PAL1 is present in all blastomere. But SK1, SKN1 was inhibiting PAL1, but kind of MX3, MEX3 helps in more inhibition of PAL1. Understood everyone? Yes or no? Just a second. Tell me. I'm just drinking some water. Okay. So now we are going to talk about the pi 1 that is our last okay. So pi 1 is going to decide the germ cell fate okay. Pi 1 for germ cell that is pi 1 will be present in P. P1 blastomer or the P finally it will reside in the P4. So it is going to decide the germ cell blastomer it is present in where it is present. It is going to be present in this P blastomere and this pi 1 also does an inhibition. It is going to inhibit SKN1 and PAL1. Pi 1 inhibits SKN1 and PAL1 because it does not want these sulfates to be made in the P lineages. Okay. In the P lineages, those are, our, those are our stem cells. So, we do not want these SKN1 and PAL1 to be transcribed there. Sorry, to be present there so that they can do the gene expression. We do not want that. Right. We only want the P sulfate to be present. So, PI1 will inhibit these two transcription factors. Right, and it will make only the germ line fate. Okay, it will only make the germ line fate. So it is kind of preserving. Oh, sorry. Just yes, it will it will preserve the totipotency. Correct, it will kind of preserve the totipotency in germ cells. A germ line cell lineage. Yes, Sachin. Okay, so pi 1, remember this pi 1 for germ line cell fate, and pi 1 will inhibit SKN1 and PAL1. It will not let that to be present in the pi cell lineages. Sorry, P cell lineages. Okay, let's see the complete overview. Everyone will understand from this. Everyone, okay. See, we have the transcription factors that we were talking about. Number one, we have SKN1. Okay, then we have PAL1 and PI1. SKN1 was helping for the EMS, right? EMS cleavage, that is, it was making MS and E. Correct. PAL1 was responsible for the P2 somatic cell, P2 somatic cell descendant. Yes or no? So it was making the C and was controlling the C and D fit. So it was making the muscles. PAI1 is responsible for P lineage, all the P lineage. Okay. Now, 
This was making your pharyngeal cells. It was making your pharyngeal cells. So if you mutate, if you mutate, if you mutate the SKN1, you see that there will be no pharynx. There will be no pharynx and only skin is made. Correct? And in the PAL one, we see that it is making C and D, correct? And if you mutate the PAL one, we see that there are no muscles. C, C is C and D fate. Basically, they were making muscles, so no muscles will be there. And if you mutate the PI, then you see that we are getting somatic cells because PI1 is deciding the P cell lineage. So germline cell lineage, germline cell lineage is decided by the PI1, correct? So if you are mutating the PI1, you will get somatic cell in somatic cell descendants in the cells, right? Got it? Further, we have this MEX3 which will go ahead to inhibit the PAL1 and also we had this SKN1 which was inhibiting the PAL1. And if you do mutation in MEX3, so MEX3 deficient, okay, MEX3 deficient, we see PAL1 there in the blastomers. Is this whole thing clear to everyone? Yes, crystal clear. This was what we were doing. This Is this whole clear to you all? Please have a look for a second. Everyone, beautiful. Okay. Now we are going to go ahead and see the specification of EMS cell. So we know that it is going to do conditional type of specification. Yes or no? Conditional specification. And basically it makes endoderm. Endoderm cell lineage is what this EMS is making. endoderms cell lineages so we saw that there was this ems which was dividing into ms and e ms was making mpg muscle pharynx gonads right it was making muscle pharynx gonads and e was making intestine yes or no but for this to happen, we require P2 as well. Okay, because EMS undergoes or follows conditional specification. It wants to interact with the other cell because it's, it does not know what to make. It's kind of naive. Okay, it requires the information. So that interaction or that information kind of is given to the EMS by this P2 cell. Okay, so this interaction is important. So if... Yes, if there is no P2, what will happen? If there is no P2, you do not have the endoderm because P2 was helping in this division and deciding the cell fate into MS and E. Okay, it is helping that cleavage to happen and make the endoderm cell lineage. Okay, intestine muscle, okay come under it will come under endoderm cell lineage so if you are not letting the ems to interact with p2 we see that endoderm is not getting found formed and you only have mesoderm please keep this in your head very very important very 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 important okay if EMS cell is not with P2. What will happen? We will see there is no endoderm and only mesoderm. So if you, if the question is asking you like this in a statement and you know you have to select the correct statements, you will be able to do this 
or you will you will be able to answer correctly if you have understood this okay so please remember ems no p2 interaction no endoderm only mesoderm right everyone everyone with me so this p2 cells are kind of giving the signal okay they are giving the signal yes sachin they are giving the signal and they are going to interact and instruct they are going to interact and instruct the ems daughter cell to become your e cell that is your endoderm the whole cleavage okay so it will make the intestine endo e cell is making the intestine correct so let's see how the specification is happening yes so we have the ems sitting here we have p2 correct and there is one receptor in ems that is mom pi what is this receptor this is mom pi okay and this p2 is releasing certain factors so we, p2 was instructing the pms uh, ems right p2 was instructing the ems it is releasing the paracrine factor and these factors are nothing but mom2 p2 mom2 remember like that p2 is going to release the paracrine factor that are mom2 this will go and bind with the receptor and do the signal transduction downstream and you will see that finally we have ms and e cells okay this interaction is what is happening which is letting the ems to get divided into ms and e so mom5 mom2 for ems who is going to come mom5 and mom2 mom5 protein is a receptor mom2 is the ligand okay mom2 is the signal given by p2 cell p2 cell is instructing yes now there is one more gene which is getting activated so in ms we see that there is pop1 gene let's okay so in ms we see that there is the presence of or activation of the pop1 gene and it's present and it is absent in e okay yes everyone so ms in ms you have pop1 gene and in e you do not have pop1 gene okay question has come from this pop gene i believe okay so our receptor which is present in the ems is mom5 and the ligand or the signal which is given by the p2 is mom2 then we have pop1 gene and pop one gene's presence and absence will be present in the ms and e cell respectively correct so this is the important thing this is how the interaction is happening in ems cell okay now let's go to talk about in ab cell this is the final thing so ab cell p2 cell is kind of giving a uh, the signal okay p2 cell is helping in releasing the ligand or the signal to divide it into ab anterior and ab posterior 
okay we saw that how ab cell were dividing into ab anterior and ab posterior okay so for that we require the p2 cell to be present again fine so p2 gives this distinguishing factor which is going to differentiate or distinguish this anterior ab anterior with or against ab posterior got it so the ab cell is dividing into ab anterior and ab posterior this is making your phn we saw that pharynx hypodermis neurons pharynx hypodermis neurons yes everyone it is making phn pharynx hypodermis neurons so let's see the interaction we have the p2 there is this ab right ab posterior here it will not come entirely let me just show you here okay we have the p2 ab posterior we have the presence of ems also here okay at the same time there is this ab anterior cell also present okay so the cleavage is happening initially we saw so let's go back once where 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 it is yes here can you see that this was the two cell stage then here there is this four cell so there is the aba abp ems and p2 so they are all present and they are kind of having the interaction okay so that interaction is what we are seeing now right so p2 is there ems is there ab posterior and ab anterior is beautifully present we have this delta not signaling that is going on which type of signaling here is coming into the picture is delta notch pathway okay delta notch pathway is going on so we are going to have a delta and a notch so p2 is going to have this ligand that is apx apx1 okay apx1 is there it with p2 which is our delta and the receptor for this that is our notch for this is glp1 who's our notch glp1 so the signaling is happening like this and we will be able to do this distinguishing between the ab posterior with ab anterior correct so our delta is apx1 and notch that is our receptor will be the glp1 apx1 from p2 it is coming and glp from a B posterior correct so in that way the a B cells are getting specified so two types of signaling is what we are seeing in totality correct what is happening entirely let's see once again so a B posterior is there p2 cell a B anterior and ems so p2 was releasing the mom2 yes or no it was releasing the paracrine factor initially for ems cell fate it is releasing the mom2 we had the receptor for this this mom2 will come and bind with this receptor this receptor is mom5 correct this is going on for ems cell fate now here we have glp glp1 and apx1 so we have juxtacrine okay juxtacrine as well as paracrine going on here yes or no yes or no is this whole thing clear this is how the entire 
interaction is happening to help in the cleavage process. Okay, everyone, everyone understood. Take a second to capture this. Understood. ABP, AB, posterior, anterior, that distinguishing is done by the delta notch pathway that is GLP and APX1 and this EMS cell fate is decided by the MOM2, MOM5, the paracrine signaling. Correct? So, if you have understood this, try this one question. Okay? Try this question. Try, try, try. Try to answer. We have just completed this. This is our PYQ itself of CSIR. Come on, chalo everyone. And please remember, developmental biology actually is very vast. Okay, it's a very big subject. So we are doing it, you know, in a concise, precise manner because our aim is to solve the questions. What is our aim? So that we'll be able to solve maximum questions that is coming in the paper. That is our aim. Our aim is not to complete the entire, you know, subject. Okay. People do uh, bachelor's and master's and, you know, so, PhD in Developmental Biology, such a huge subject it is. Okay, we cannot cover that, the whole big book of that. So, re please remember that and be focused on whatever is, you know, taught to you. It will be good because you will be able to revise it in a proper manner. Okay. What is the answer? Come on. Have you read the question? Yes, everyone. What the question is saying? Let's see the answer. Okay. So, the C. elegant embryo is using both autonomous and conditional modes of specification. Okay. At the four cell stage. That can be seen in the development of the endoderm cell lineage. And also in the establishment of the dorsal ventral. So, that is also there. Now you have to, I haven't mentioned, uh, you have to answer the correct statements, okay? The question was to answer the correct statements. Okay, so from the statements are given uh, for this and you have to say, tell me which is the correct one. Let's see A. If the P2 cell is removed at the early 4 cell stage, the EMS cell will divide into MS cells and no endoderm will be made. We saw that, right? If you are removing the P2, we saw that no endoderm is present and we will have only mesoderm. So, statement is absolutely correct. Then, let's see statement B. In POP1 deficient embryos, if POP1 is not there, both EMS daughter cells will become E cells. Yes or no? We saw here that POP1 gene is present in MS, absent in E. So, if POP1 gene is deficient, that means we are going to get only E. Yes. So, statement B is also correct. Only three people have answered. What about others? What all you think? Then let's see the C statement. When the position of AB anterior and posterior was reserved, their fates get reserved and no normal embryo forms. No, right? That is not happening. The fate is not getting reversed. The interaction is what which is important. Correct? The P2's interaction. So if it is reversed, we will see that the fates are not getting reversed and it is saying no normal embryos are formed. Normal embryos will be forming. So, C is wrong. If C is wrong, we already have the answer. Yes, normal embryo will form. 
then let's see d also so in embryos whose mother have mutant glp glp is mutated abp is transformed into aba cell is that so if glp is mutated glp is not there abp will look like aba yes correct because the distinguishing was done by the glp1 and apx so if glp1 uh, is mutated it will get into it will be transformed into aba cell because both will then will be aba cell because glp is not there glp for abp got it so our answer is abd whoever has given the abd as answer is absolutely correct understood see how the questions are coming mostly you see the statement based questions you know and you are getting four marks for this so if you eliminate one also you will come to the answer right so we have done with our today's lecture okay we have completed c elegant right it's an important topic if you haven't seen the previous lectures please go ahead and see the previous lectures oh summary okay I'm not making the slide in totality. Let's just see one by one. Quick recap. Okay, so we started with the cleavage process. In previous lecture, we talked about the vulva, cell, uh, vulva specification and vulval development. Okay, so we are making different cell lineages from the zygote. So cleavage is happening and we are making the entire embryo and then the next progeny. The important thing is the type of cleavage which is present in the C. elegans is rotational holoblastic. It is helochomal. So it is very important that uh, to know for you to know that the cleavage type is rotational holoblastic other organism will be having different types of cleavage and it is showing a symmetric type of division and it is making founder cell and stem cell. Founder cells are A, B, M, S, E, C, D and the stem cells are P1 to P4 lineages. So the zygote will go ahead to divide into one founder cell, one stem cell, then the stem cell will divide into one founder, one stem cell. All the founder cells are making your differentiated cells and the P cell lineages are the stem cells. Good morning everyone. Sorry, why I am saying good morning Komal. Good evening. It's not evening. Okay, so the cleavage process is like this. Alright, so zygote is dividing into AB. AB will divide into the further division anterior posterior left and right. Then we have the P1 which divides into EMS and P2. P2 is dividing into C and P3 and P3 is dividing into D and P4. And finally, P4 is our germline cell lineage which is having two cells Z1 and Z2. Correct? So in totality, we saw the number of cells also. So we are making that 949 somatic cells that we initially talked about, which is present in the C. elegans. So for anterior posterior axis, next we saw that how the male pronucleus position is deciding the posteriority of the zygote. So posterior pole will be decided by the male pronucleus position and not the sperm entry. And our oocyte has no polarity anyway. Okay, so the first AP axis is decided by the male pronucleus position. After that, so it is happening before division itself. After that, we have the P granules which are migrating towards the posterior pole. And for this migration and localization of the P granules, we require microfilaments that uh, will be inhibited if cytochalasin D is there. Okay, cytochalasin D will inhibit microfilaments. So that is how we came into the conclusion that microfilaments are important for the uh, localization of the P granules. Then we talked about the anterior pars and posterior pars. Par 6 and 3 for anterior axis, par 1 and 2 will be accumulated in the posterior. It will help in that anterior posterior. Further confirmation, yes. Then the specification, we talked about the conditional and autonomous founder cells will be showing the conditional specification. We see that how the interaction with the P cell, P cell lineages is helping uh, the cells cleavage, the founder cells cleavage and stem cell is autonomous, it knows everything. 
okay the fate and everything has decided for it so if you keep the founder cells in isolation without the you know interaction with the p cell lineages we will see that the cleavage is not happening and we will not see the normal default or the normal type of cleavage that we want to see or which should be there then we talked about the transcription factors yes let's see here in totality so we saw about skn1 pal1 and pi1 skn1 for ems right it will make the ms and e cells if you mutate skn1 you will not see any pharyngeal cells then for pal1 pal1 important for p2 somatic descendants if you mutate them you will not see the c and d cell fates pi1 for p cell lineage okay mutate uh, mutated pi1 you will see somatic cell because it is important for p cell lineage so you will only see the somatic max3 hates pal1 skn1 also hates pal1 so max3 deficient mutant pal1 in the blastomere and um, skn1 also is kind of inhibiting pal1 so it will not want the pal1 to be present in the ems cells correct then we talked about the interaction so p2 has to be there with the ems so that it can divide into ms and e and show its cell fate right if you do not keep ems with p2 if p2 is not there we will see that no endoderm is formed because these uh, cells will not get differentiated and only mesoderm will be there then we talked about these two types of interaction right for ems and ab specification where we saw that how the paracrine and juxtacrine signaling is coming into picture yes with that we have completed our c elegant everyone got it done c elegant is done and dusted yes for everyone for life science and gate we have free pyq is going on on our app okay so free pyqs free videos free ranker strategies all free stuffs are available for biotechnology and life science both and also who are going to give mh set who are targeting mh set for 2024 you have recorded lectures test series on our app okay you are getting 30 percent off you can use this ifs code okay with that we wrap this session up is it so angel good to know that you learned and you know it will definitely help you for the exam correct no problem komal you were there yesterday right komal evening thank you thank you everyone thank you so much okay so yes important thing to tell you uh, from next week also from monday we will continue with development biology itself we will talk about tetrapod limb development so we'll start from there okay then we will uh, so for the next whole week also we have the scheduled uh, you know the lecture scheduled for you so you can see at our channel right thank you everyone Please do not forget to like this session, right, like this and share it with your friends. Definitely it will be really, really helpful because these we are giving you the crisp sessions for your exam. You will definitely get benefited 10 to 12 marks. Definitely you can get from whatever we are teaching you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.